morning everybody and welcome to our online Central Community Church of God worship service here in Hanford, California. If this is your first time joining us, well I want to let you know my name is Malcolm, Malcolm Bolduck and I'm fortunate enough to be the pastor here at this church and uh, we want to extend to you this invitation for you to come along with us and become a part of our church family where you can feel that you belong, for your val for I want you to know you're valued by the Lord, and He has a purpose for each of you. He's placed within you a special gift. 
And we as a church would love to see you grow within that gift so then we could all receive that blessing with what God has blessed you with. So will you join me now as we start this morning with a, a message from the Bible in Psalm 95, verses 1 through 7. And it says, Come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout joyfully to the rock of our salvation. Let us come to him with thanksgiving. Let's sing psalms of praise to him. For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods. He holds in his hands the depths of the earth and the mightiest mountains. The sea belongs to him, for he made it. His hands, his hands form the dry land too. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our maker. For he is our God, and we are the people he watches over. The flock under his care. Folks, before we pray... The most frequent position of worship found in the Bible is that of bowing down, kneeling, or sometimes laying flat on the ground. Now the psalmist realized just how awesome God was here, and he wrote to us in Psalm 95, verse 6, O come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker. And no wonder that it's frequently said that when they came to Jesus, they fell down at his feet. And I believe for myself on the day that I do see him, that I will do the same. Let's pray. Father God, Lord, we just bless you for giving us the grace and good health to gather together in your name. Lord, you provide us with all our needs and ensure that we're never lacking. So Father, we ask you to accept our worship in the holy name of Jesus. And we pray as we continue today's church service that we feel that we will feel your presence among us wherever we are. We pray for all those here and those that have yet to see your power that, that we may always serve you and grow in you. And at the end of this day, Lord, let us go out into the world to glorify your name and live, live in your presence. And this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
Hi, folks. Today's message is called God Does Not Change. And, you know, the book of Malachi is the last book in the Old Testament. And its prophecy came about about 100 years after God's people returned to Jerusalem from Babylonian captivity. That was a time of great joy and great relief to return to the homeland and rebuild the city and the temple. But, but you know what? A hundred years is a very long time. And it may not seem like it when you consider the whole span of Bible history, but from the perspective of a life of, or a particular generation of people, or the history of a nation, a hundred years can be a really, really long time. A lot can change, as you know, in a hundred years. Attitudes can shift. Things can be forgotten and let go by the wayside. And sure enough, that was the case with Israel. In this period of 100 years, a lot had changed. A whole lot had changed. And whatever excitement there may have been at returning and rebuilding, it was now gone. The nation had reverted to its old self. The services of the temple had, had, become, had become common and just profane. The nation was once again in sorry shape spiritually. And you know what? They blamed God for their troubles. Yeah. And despite his forbearance, they had the audacity to accuse God of not loving or caring about them. Sound familiar? And once again, the fires of God's judgment were smoldering. Except that there was one thing that kept him from destroying them altogether. Read with me in verse 6, Malachi 3, verse 6. It says, I am the Lord, I do not change. That is why you descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. So God made a covenant promising that a Messiah, that a Messiah would come from their people and bring salvation to the world through them. Wow. You see, God did not destroy them because the promises that were made to them still had to be fulfilled through them in Christ. And God, like God says, He cannot break His word. They deserve to be destroyed. But God did not destroy them because of His covenant, because of His promise. The prophet Balaam, knowing how capable he himself, he himself was of deceit, and knowing how he could be tempted by bribery to change from one course to another, said this of God in Numbers 23, verse 19. He said this, God is not a man, so he does not lie. He is not human, so he does not change his mind. Has he ever spoken and failed to act? Has he ever promised and not carried it through? See, God, folks, God does not change. That's the point of this whole message today, and it should always be the point of every message, that God does not change. We can't think of God in terms of us, in terms of human beings. People change their minds, they change their attitudes, sometimes they're, they even change their personalities over time. But God never changes. God never changes, and He succinctly states that on more than one occasion, in His Word, He says, I do not change. But only does he only not but not only does he not change, folks, he cannot change. He cannot change. Today we're going to study what it means to serve an unchanging God. It's difficult for us to imagine one who never, never changes because everything in this world changes with the passing of enough time. Everything about our lives is changing from one moment to moment, from day to day, from year to year. It's always changing, evolving or devolving. Even the earth and the heavens are changing. Things that look to us that look to us like they never change are surely, even though we don't see it with our eyes, are surely slowly and constantly being reshaped by the forces of time. Psalm 102 verses 25 through 27 says, "Long ago you laid the foundation of the earth and made the heavens with your hands. They will perish, but you remain forever." They will wear out like old clothing. You will change them like a garment and discard them. But you, you are always the same. You will live forever. Everything from the microscopic atom to the sun's solar system and the universe are all in a constant state of flux and transition and change, always changing, evolving. Everything God is everything that God has created is changeable. 
But God does not change. But God does not change. James made this contrast in James 1.17. He says, whatever is good and perfect is a gift coming down to us from God our Father, who created all the lights in the heavens. He never changes or casts a shifting shadow. Now one may say, hasn't God changed throughout the course of human history? Isn't there an old covenant, Malcolm? And isn't there, isn't there also a new covenant? Haven't the economies through which God has dealt with people in different times, haven't they changed? They have, but those things don't mean that God has changed. The Bible is not merely a compilation, folks, of books and writings. The Bible has a continuity about it. It's a story. Folks, it's a story. Paul refers to the mystery of the scheme of redemption that spans the ages from eternity to eternity, as in Ephesians 3, 10 through 11, it says, to the intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and the powers in the heavenly places, according to the eternal purpose which he accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord. Now the word manifold means variegated or many colored, Okay like a grand mosaic work of art. Each part or piece of the divine story, beautiful and significant within itself, every interaction between, between God and man down through the stream of time seems independent of itself. But it's not, because when all of it is arranged in place by the master artist, a larger picture begins to emerge. And that picture here is Christ Jesus. Jesus and the redemption of the world. There's a continuum from Genesis 1 to Revelation 22. And everything that has come to pass has all been according to the purpose that God has had from eternity. He's not just playing it by ear, everyone. He's not. He's not just playing it by ear. He created the world with a purpose. He created us with a purpose. His dealings with us have been with purpose. 2 Timothy 1 verse 9 says, For God saved us and called us to live a holy life. He did this not because we deserved it, but because that was His plan from before the beginning of time to show us His grace through Christ Jesus. So God's plan throughout the ages has evolved, has, has involved change, has involved change, sorry, and has, and has brought change, but the plan never changed. Okay? God never changed. He does not change, and He will not change. But not only is God's purpose unchanging, God's attributes and personality are unchanging. Some almost believe that the Bible is a story of at least two different gods. And you've heard people say this. The God revealed in the Old Testament and the God revealed in the New Testament. On one hand, a God of rules, of law, of anger and wrath, vengeance and judgment, and on the other hand, a God of grace, of mercy, love, kindness, and understanding. A God who is not all that concerned or angered by sin, but who basically hands, hand, handed us the reins to live and worship as we please. Our choice. But really, that's not completely accurate. You see, the Bible does not give us two revelations of God because, like I said before that we started, God hasn't changed. The Bible from Genesis to Revelation is one revelation of God, all pointing to Christ. Yes, He has established different covenants at different points in times, different promises at different points in times, in time. But all of that has to do with His overarching, overarching pur purpose. And he has not changed. It's not that God has decided not to change, by the way. He, just, he didn't just arbitrarily say to us, okay, I won't change. It's because God cannot change. Because if he changed, then he wouldn't be God. If he changed, then he wouldn't be God. Think about it this way. The perfection of God demands his immutability. If something changes, that change will result in something either being better or worse, right? It, if it makes no difference, then it's really not a change, right? Well, God cannot become more perfect, 
nor is it possible for God to become no longer perfect. God is simply God. He has an immutable nature. He is what he is. He is who he is. He didn't just decide to act a certain way and be a certain way. No, because God is God. For example, the Bible doesn't say that God merely loves or can love. The Bible says, get this, the Bible says, no, God is love. God is love. He didn't become love. He is love, and he has always been love. The Bible doesn't say that God chooses to be holy or that he can be holy and separate from sin. It says that God is holy. God told his people through Moses in the Old Testament and through Peter and in the New Testament. And it is repeated several times in God's word. You shall be holy, for I am holy. God was not holy in the Old Testament. And then became love and grace in the New Testament. As though there is some contradiction between the two. God has always been holy. And he still is holy. And God has always been love. And he still is love. He will always be all of those things, everyone. God showed incredible grace to his people in the Old Testament. I mean, where do people get the idea that there was no grace in the Old Covenant? God was a, God, well, God was a great God of grace even in that dispensation. Even in that dispensation. Think about it. Can we not read that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord? Really? God could have immediately destroyed Adam and Eve when they sinned in that garden, but he did not. His grace, folks, his grace made a way, and his mercy spared them both. They paid a price for their sin, yes, but God was still acting in grace. God spared his own people, as we read in our text, and gave them space for repentance beyond what they deserved. Yes, even back then, the Old Testament... God was a God of grace. By the same token, God promises wrath even in the New Testament age. Oh, yes, he does. In fact, time and again, we're told by Paul, Peter, and Jude, and others that the divine strokes of punishment that fell on the people of old are examples to erring and apostate children of God today, today. To go even a step further, the Hebrew writer indicated that the judgment and punishment of God is even worse for one who turns from the truth today. Because now, why? Because now we have the full revelation in Christ Jesus. But God hasn't changed. The difference is now that we have the realized blessings and promises of God that are all found in Christ. We have them. They didn't have those then in the Old Testament. Those before Christ look forward to Christ, yes, and all those events pointed forward to Christ. And God's dealing with them were preparing the way and creating the expectation and hope of Christ. Praise be to God, folks, that now we know the fulfillment of those promises. Yes, and covenants and blessings, oh man. But you see, all through all that, to where we are today, God has not changed. No. No. God still hates sin as much as he ever did. God still promises to punish sin. And yes, he still loves sinners like he always has. He, still, he is the same God who went searching for the rebellious pair in that garden and made a sacrifice and covered their nakedness. He's the same God who told Cain in, in, in Genesis 4 verse 7, it says, you will be accepted if you do what is right. You will be accepted if you do what is right. That same God sent his, so, his holy and spotless son down that golden staircase of heaven into this awful, sin-filled world to save it. To save it. God hasn't changed. He has been acting according to the same purpose and according with his own attributes from eternity, and he will to eternity. He has not gone from being rage, a raging, jealous, vengeful, wrathful, thundering God of old to some aging, senile, doting, docile grandfather today. No. 
He is the same God today that he was to Adam. He's, he was the same God today that he was to Noah and that he was to Abraham, to Moses, to the Jews of Malachi's day, to the church of the first century, to the church of a hundred years ago. God, folks, God simply does not change. Not only God does God's personality not change, but neither does he change his pronouncements. Just as God is immutable himself, his word, folks, is unbreakable. God cannot lie, the Bible says in John 17, 17. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your, wor teach them your word, which is truth. Not sometimes truth, was truth. Can be truth or will be truth. Thy word is truth. It's much like when Jesus said before Abraham was, I am. God's, God's word is eternal. It's unbreakable. And the Bible is as relevant and as authoritative in our world lives today as it was to the early churches to whom the apostles wrote. And I'm going to tell you, folks, time has not rendered it null and void. Cultural and technological and societal achievements and advances, advancements have not made the word of God irrelevant. They really, it really haven't. Some suggest that God's view of things, his standards and expectations have changed with the times, and so should we. And that God just sort of follows our lead. But that's not what the Bible says. I know you all want to believe that, but the Bible doesn't say that. 1 Peter 1, 24 through 25 says this, As the scriptures say, people are like grass. Their beauty is like a flower in the field. The grass withers and the flower fades. But the word of the Lord remains forever. And that word is the good news that was preached to you. Or Mark 13, 31, which says, Heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. That reminds you that what the Bible calls sin is still sin. Living in a modern world will not change that. It does not change that. The ebb and flow of culture does not change that. God's word is immutable. It does not change. Sin is still sin, even if the world igno ignores what God has said about it. John 12, 48, But all who reject me and my message will be judged on the day of judgment by the truth that I have spoken. Sin is still sin, even if the majority celebrates and embraces that sin. It's still sin. Exodus 23, verse 2 says, You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. When you are called to testify in a dispute, do not be swayed by the crowd to twist justice. Sin is still sin, even if it's legal. You know, in the end, folks, there's a court much higher than the Supreme Court. I can promise you that. Acts 5, 29 says, But Peter and the apostles replied, We must obey God rather than any human authority. Sin is still sin, even if you don't see the harm in it, and you don't recognize it as sin. It, it is still sin if the Bible teaches that it is sin. You can't change that. Proverbs 14, 12 says, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. Sin is still sin, even if the church tolerates and accepts it. We see people in religion tolerating and accepting many things that were unthinkable just a few years ago. Some people get the idea that it must be all right then, but it's not all right. It's not all right. They get the idea that it must be okay, but it's not. God said not to pagans, but to his own wayward people. He said, Isaiah 5.20, he says, What sorrow for those who say that evil is good and good is evil? That dark is light and light is dark. That bitter is sweet and sweet is bitter. Sin is still sin if wicked people try to justify and defy it even. People, you know, we'd like to twist the scriptures, folks. We really do. And Jude 4 speaks of the some who would attempt to turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. Sin is still sin even if, it's, even if we're persecuted for believing and preaching it. John, 1 John 3.13 says, says, Don't be surprised, dear brothers and sisters, if the world hates you. And that's the problem we run into there. You know, immorality is still a sin. It will always be a sin in God's eyes because that's how his word describes it. Sins of the flesh, 
sexual sins that are defined in the Word of God. And folks, time has not changed that. The Supreme Court can't change that. The President can't change that. Nobody can change that. God's Word is immutable, and His Word cannot be broken. We may ignore or dismiss sin. We may become flippant about sin and immorality. But in the end, it's still sin. And I'm sorry, but it's a, it's, 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 it's a big deal in the eyes of God. Whether our culture sees it that way or not, we're Christians. This is, what, this is what we believe. This is what we follow. The truth. And the truth is God. Unscriptural practices are still unscriptural in His eyes. It doesn't change over time. God gave a pattern for the church. God revealed His church when He built it in the first century. We have this book to guide us, this Bible to guide us in all the matters of faith and practice, and that doesn't change. Men may ch try and change it, and we certainly have, and drift away from the actual pattern that was set out for us. But that doesn't mean that God has changed that pattern, no. Or that His commandments or examples that were set forth for us no longer matter. No. You see, God's Word and His pronouncements do not change. God also does not change when it comes to His promises. It's tempting to doubt the promises of God. Of course it is. It's tempting to look at circumstances and current events and either forget what God has promised or let our faith in His promises sort of waver a bit. It's easy to allow time to cause the fires of excitement and anticipation to, to burn low and eventually just go out. But I would remind you that God often takes a lot of time to bring His promises to pass. You know, it took nearly 4,000 years for God's seed promise to Eve to be fulfilled. But in the fullness of time, Christ was born. The Bible says it happened in the fullness of time or at the right time. It took 120 years for God's warning of judgment to actually come to Noah and the antediluvians of judgment to come to pass. But, but finally, sure enough, the sky grew dark, the thunder rumbled, and those heavens, they opened up, and, and it started to rain. Now, it took a long time for Abraham and Sarah to have a son, that son of promise, in fact, it was perplexing to them why it took so long, especially considering their age after, after God made the promise. But 15 years, 15 years later, despite their presumptuous scheme regarding Hagar and Ishmael, the baby Isaac was born. So you see, God does keep His promises. The Hebrew, writer, the Hebrew writer warns Christians not to, not to turn away and go back to the sacrifices of the temple and the services of the, of the Jewish economy, but to remain steadfast in Jesus. Not to waver from the good confession that, that they had made, that they had one time made. It was tempting to turn away because of the persecution that was bearing down upon them. It was tempting to think that, that God was not in what, in, in what they were a part of or that He had forsaken them because of their circumstances. Hebrews 10 23 actually says, Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. For God can be trusted to keep His promise. God has made those who will believe. and obey many promises. And He is true to those promises. He will not go back on those promises. You know, God cannot lie, folks. He can't lie. Even, even when from our human vantage point, we simply can't see how it will work out or how those things can be true. He can't lie. So I ask everybody today, wherever you are, do you have faith in what, in what God says? You know, Jesus made another promise, and I, we're going to look at it in John 14, 2 and 3. It says, There is more than enough room in my Father's home. If this were not so, would I have told you that I'm going to prepare a place for you? When everything is ready, I will come and I'll get you, so that you will always be with me where I am. My goodness, that's a wonderful statement. But it's been 2,000 years since, since Jesus made that promise. But I'm telling you folks, it's true. It's true. One day he's going to burst through the blue. One day he's going to return and bring this world to judgment. 
Are you ready for that time? Are you ready for that time? And you know what? You need to be because, because God will not forget his promise. Because why? Because God does not change. God does not change. He will not forget his promise. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I believe that you uphold the creation by the strength of your your mighty power and your great wisdom. And that in your word you have laid out all that we need to live godly lives that are pleasing to you. Lord, we desire to do your will. And Father, we pray that that we may serve you in the manner that you require. Lord, in, in the humility of heart, we admit that we can do nothing ourselves, but only as you give us your sufficient grace, your wisdom, and your strength. Help us, we pray, Lord, to live each day of our lives in holiness and righteousness in humility of heart and self-control. Help us to, to, to walk in spirit and in truth and to do only those things that we have heard from you. Through the word of you, Lord, and the, and the gentle promptings of your Holy Spirit in our inner soul. May we look to you and not to the ways of the world. May we grow in grace and in knowledge of, the, of, of our Lord Jesus. And may we apply ourselves diligently to pursue, you, pursue your greater plans and purpose in our lives willingly and accepting correction, eager to forgive others and enjoying sweet fellowship with you day by day. And this we ask in Jesus' holy name. Amen.
Hey, let's close this morning, folks, with a closing prayer, shall we? Father God, we felt your presence today with this worship. And Lord, we, we pray that the impact will be lasting in our lives and will always continue in the truth of who you are. Lord, we wrap us in your faithful love, Father, and the, this worship, that today's worship will empower our souls to the beauty of your love for us. And we will continue it in it in all the days of our lives. And your love, Father, will be upon our lives. As we depart from this worship session today, speak to us, Father, and encourage our hearts. Teach us to walk in your precepts and let this worship be more than just a gathering, but be an actual blessing. Today, in the meeting of our lives, Lord, we pray that you will make our hearts to be focused on you, to have you as our all, and that we accept your best always. So bless all these hearts today as we leave. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Folks, may God the Father prepare your journey and Jesus the Son guide your footsteps. The Spirit of life strengthen your body. The three in one watch over you on every road that you may follow in the days and weeks ahead. Have a blessed week, folks, and we'll see you next Sunday. Don't forget, we'll gather together on Tuesday night at 6.30 p.m. Contact me. But we'll gather again here for sure, 9.45 a.m. Next week, keep praying that we'll one day get back together again, all together in this building, and just really sure in fellowship. I miss you all, as I always tell you each week, and I, and I mean that from the bottom of my heart. My wife and I miss you all so much, and we can hardly wait to that day we get back together. And keep praying about that. Have a blessed week, folks. I'll see you soon, okay? God bless you. Bye now.